Hello and welcome to a look at the required rate of return with me, Andy Duncan, here at Finlingo.com. This is a deceptively simple subject, but one that's actually quite nuanced. Let's take a look at what's going on. First, we'll head over to Finlingo Island, deep in the Pacific, which is a privately owned territory. On this fabulous island, a new company has started up called Andy's Dodgy Jet Skis. Andy would like to borrow 100 Finlingo dollars for a measly two years. Now each Finlingo dollar is a paper claim for one gold gram. Another much larger company, Sean's Luxury Yachts, also wants to borrow $100 for the same two-year period. Remarkably, you're an investor and you have exactly 100 Finlingo dollars that you'd like to invest. I know, it's an incredible coincidence. But which company should you lend your money to and at what rate of return is acceptable on either of these two investments? First, we need to examine a few potential things to calculate acceptable rates of return on both of these potential investments. Here's the two equations we need. The first is the nominal risk-free rate, which is made up of the real risk-free rate plus the expected inflation rate. The second equation we need is the required return. Now this is the nominal risk-free rate above plus the default risk premium, the liquidity risk premium and the maturity risk premium. Before we get to those last three premiums, let's break down the nominal risk-free Free rate. Let's say Finlingo Bank, the most reliable 100% gold reserve bank in the world, borrows money at a nominal what's said to be risk-free rate on its gold bonds of 3%. How do we make up that nominal risk-free rate? Well, imagine that at the start of a year, the price of a small boat on Finlingo Island is exactly $100. The following year, the boat costs $101. Why? Because gold is being mined continuously globally at the rate of about 1% a year when compared to current global gold stocks held above ground. So we've got expected price inflation of 1% a year. So if you lend $100 at a 1% return and get back $101 a year later, in both cases you'd only be able to buy the same small boat at either end of the time period. So you'd fail to gain any real increase in wealth at a 1% return, despite the nominal increase of 1% in money. The price inflation of 1% eats up all of your potential gain. Let's get back to the equation. That 1% of expected price inflation makes up the second part of the equation. So when Finlingo Bank offers a nominal risk-free rate of 3%, the real risk-free rate is just 2%. Fortunately for this video, you decide you'd rather be a little more adventurous than just getting a risk-free return. So you decide to invest in either Andy's dodgy jet skis or Sean's luxury yachts. Let's get on then to the second equation, but now we can fill in the first part. The nominal risk-free rate for both Andy's company and Sean's company is the same. It's 3%. So what about this default risk premium? The jet ski company is a startup, so it's got a very high chance of defaulting on its loan, and you might lose all of your stake money. So you decide Andy's default risk premium is 10%. Sean's company is much safer, but still has some default risk. So you set his default risk premium to a much lower 3%. Now we can do the liquidity risk. Andy's company is very small, so there'll be significant liquidity issues. But what does this mean? It means it'll be difficult to sell your investment quickly whenever you want to get rid of it because you're swimming in a pool of just a very few potential buyers. This difficulty in selling is especially true in any financial crisis. Despite building jet skis, which yes, do go on water, Andy's dodgy jet skis is a very illiquid company. You decide his liquidity premium is 4%. Sean's company, on the other hand, is very liquid. It's large and stable and has a long record of consistently high profits over several decades. There are lots of buyers in his liquidity pool, so you make his liquidity risk premium just 1%. Finally, when you tie up money for just two years, you're not taking on much maturity risk, but let's try to cover this on another diagram. Sean's also offering a range of other bond investments. There's the two-year maturity bond we know about, the five-year maturity bond, and the 10-year maturity bond. When your money's tied up for longer and longer periods, you're missing out on other investment opportunities for longer and longer periods. So the longer you lend money, the greater the return you need to make up for this loss of opportunity. Plus, you might just want your money back quickly to buy an ice cream. So you might decide on different maturity risk premiums of 1%, 3% and 8% for these three different bonds. This driving force is, incidentally, what drives the normal shape of a standard yield curve, but that's fortunately a subject for another day. 
Getting back to our investment choice, we decide that for a two-year loan, we'll set a maturity risk premium of 1% on both Andy's dodgy jet skis and Sean's luxury yachts. We can now work out the required rates of return for both potential investments. For Andy's company, we need at least 18%. For Sean's, we need at least 8%. Andy does offer 18% on his bond, but Sean's only offering 7%. So you lend the money to Andy because you're getting an acceptable rate of return. And that's about it for the required rate of return. Let's try an example then on Finlingo.com. First, isolate all the key values. Then note them down by plugging the right numbers into the right parts of the two different equations. Now check if the answer comes up on Finlingo. Now select it. Hopefully this video has explained how the required rate of return gets calculated. Get over now to Finlingo.com to really drill these deceptively simple equations directly into your brain. Then you can answer these questions quickly in any exam by choosing the right equations at the right time. Finlingo. Speak finance fluently.